So the idea behind this session was to put together a series of talks from experts that folks who attend other sessions, coronary or structural, can get a feel for what's going on in the field of peripheral interventions. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite my dear friend from Duke University and the head of cardiology, Dr. Manesh Patel, to talk about antithrombotic drugs and how he sees he incorporates it into his PAD and CLI practice. Take it away, Manesh. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. And I think uh, any talk about PAD in these days uh, is getting more and more interest into the antithrombotic or medical space. These are my disclosures. I really have two messages. I'm going to talk a little bit. This isn't new to this audience. I'll just spend two slides on sort of under treatment. When I say under treatment, I'm actually going to talk about the medical under treatment and a little bit about revascularization. And then I'm going to think about antithrombotics and PAD and tell you about the misconceptions that we've been thinking about as cardiologists that may or may not explain some of the things we know about PAD. So let me get started. First, this is a manuscript from Denmark which showed something that I think exists here. Now, why was it in Denmark? Because they actually know the prescription rate of aspirin in Denmark because everybody's on the same sort of formulary, if you will. If you had coronary artery disease and your chance of getting an aspirin or an antiplatelet agent was one, if you have PAD, this is now 2010, 2012, you had a 40% chance of getting an antiplatelet therapy. You had a 50% chance roughly of getting a statin and a 40% chance of getting it. If you had PAD plus CAD, it was higher, but not all the way back to CAD. Even if you had CAD with PAD, it was less than CAD. So something to think about. What about when you use dual antiplatelet therapy? This is from Medicare Part D. This was published uh, recently in the American Heart Journal. 86,000 patients, roughly, who undergo revascularization. 25% of these patients were on dual antiplatelet therapy for greater than 30 days. So the majority of patients were not getting dual antiplatelet therapy for greater than 30 days. We can talk about what the right answer is. We may not know that yet. But what's interesting is 20% of patients were not on any P2I12 after revascularization. And then this is the final one we use often. Shriek Vimlupali presented this from Medicare. And this is from 10 years, from 2000 to 2010. Up to 30% of patients didn't get any sort of arterial testing prior to an amputation in the United States. So it just tells you about the unmet need that we're all going to be working on against other things. So let's talk about the antithrombotics. The first misconception. One stronger antiplatelet agent is better than a weaker one for PAD. Well, that means, like, that should make sense, I think. Like, if you look at this review we wrote, when you think about the platelet, for many years, our strategy has been to increase the antiplatelet therapy for patients with coronary disease. Remember, it started with aspirin. Then we added aspirin plus clopidogrel. Then we had aspirin plus prasugrel or ticagrelor in patients with acute coronary syndromes. And that led to eventually chronic therapies and then dual antiplatelet therapies. So what's the evidence in PAD? Many of you know this. This is now 20 years old. The Capri trial evaluated aspirin plus clopidogrel. And a little stronger clopidogrel was better. It was about 8.7% better. And then it is better when you think about the PAD patients. It was, it was better, but not impressively better, but it was better. I participated in the Euclid trial with many people. This was a 14,000 patient trial where ticagrelor was compared to clopidogrel in 14,000 patients with PAD, and they were patients who had an ABI or they had had prior revascularization greater than 30 days ago. And the findings of this trial, which was published in 2016, showed there was no difference between monotherapy with ticagrelor versus clopidogrel for the composite of CV death, MI, or stroke, or for CV death or MI or even when we included acute limb ischemia or revascularization. So my first sort of conclusion on monotherapy with PAD would be aspirin versus placebo. I didn't show you these data. It is mildly better than placebo, although the, the trend crosses one. Clopidogrel is slightly better than aspirin. That's the Capri trial. Clopidogrel is similar to ticaglor. So at least in chronic outpatient PAD, a stronger antiplatelet agent wasn't clearly better. What's misconception number two? two antiplatelet agents are better than one. Now, in coronary disease, we often think about that. Well, what is the data in PAD? There's really one big trial, the Charisma trial, that looked at clopidogrel plus aspirin versus placebo plus aspirin, and now 20,000 patients published years ago again, and showed that there was a small difference, 0.5%. That was not numerically different statistically, and there was more bleeding with clopidogrel plus aspirin. So we do use it after revascularization because our patients have received a stent, but the long-term data for that therapy is also not there. So what's the new learning, if you will? I think the newest learning is that for patients with peripheral artery disease, because remember it's a vascular atherosclerotic burden, 
that dual pathway therapy agents, or agents that are doing more than just antiplatelet work. The first agent that was studied in this regard was Vorapaxar, where there's certainly antiplatelet work and tissue factor effect and possibly into the factor 10As. Vorapaxar we'll talk about first, and then we'll talk about rivaroxaban that's being studied as a factor 10A inhibitor with aspirin and PAD. So Vorapaxar was added on top of aspirin or clopidogrel in patients after an acute coronary syndrome, and this subgroup of those patients who had PAD by Dr. Banaka showed that in fact, they did have less rates of hospitalization or acute limb ischemia, less urgent revascularization. And even if you looked at their peripheral vascular revascularization rates, after a couple of years, they started to diverge so that there was some chronic effect. But this therapy was on top of aspirin or clopidogrel and patients were bleeding and it was hard to get adopted. So this is the, the rivaroxaban data, the COMPASS trial you have likely heard about. Two and a half milligrams of rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared to aspirin. There was a five milligram arm. This trial was stopped early, 22,000 patients, was stopped early for a mortality benefit. So patients with coronary disease and PAD got into the trial. Here's the PAD cohort. You can see that the patients with PAD had a rate of death, myocardial infarction or stroke of 5.1%. It was higher statistically with aspirin alone and likely, uh, and there was trends in all three of the groups. There is a price to pay, there is an increase in bleeding, but there was no change in fatal bleeding or ICH, and this is the two and a half milligrams twice a day dose of rivaroxaban. The PAD subgroup of COMPASS showed reduced acute limb ischemia, major amputation, all vascular amputations, and all major adverse limb events. So it becomes complicated, even though these events aren't very numerically high, it does look like when you add them all up or individually, they're statistically less in this fairly large study. So what are my conclusions to start us off on antithrombotic therapy and PAD? How would I think about it today and how would I think about it over the next year? It's common, we have to do better for that. I don't think many people would disagree with that. The best current therapy for PAD in chronic care, I would say, is monotherapy, ideally with generic clopidogrel. It's the one that has the most data. Post-revascularization, the majority of patients are being treated for less than three months, although we know for the DCB and some of the other device trials, they got six months of therapy. So if you use those therapies, you might use longer. Dual pathway inhibition rather than DAPT with rivaroxaban plus aspirin reduced MACE, male, and amputation. As this goes through the FDA, I suspect a fair bit of our patients with PAD will likely be at least candidates for this. And finally, there's a trial called Voyager PAD for patients post-revascularization or post-peripheral intervention. 6,500 patients already enrolled with aspirin compared to aspirin plus rivaroxaban. They were allowed to have DAPT post-revascularization for up to three months or even up to six months. This will be completed in 2019 and will likely inform us even more how to use these therapies for our patients with PAD. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, you know, Manish is the, is the PI of the Euclid trial, and I don't think anyone could have given this talk with such a large number of volume of information in eight to nine minutes. Okay, so take a breath, All drink right. some water, uh, and I'm going to invite my dear friend, Dr. Mehdi Shishibur. Uh, he recently presented a late-breaking trial on biologic and cell therapies in CLI, and he's going to talk about the role of biologic therapies uh, in CLI. Thanks, Subhash, and it's hard to follow Dr. Patel. That was impressive, huh? Uh, but uh, really impressive uh, data, and it's amazing how we are innovating, meaning that how we're going to change our approach to PAD and CLI. We are going more towards pharmacotherapy rather than devices. So related to this, I wanted to start with this case to highlight the limitation of our approaches. So this is a 65-year-old gentleman who came to us with end-stage renal disease, diabetes, hypertension, all the good stuff, known PAD, and had this kind of a presentation. This level of necrosis, there is avulsion, there is dependent rubor, and multiple risk factors. So we did a ABI and a PVR, and ABI is 0.55. So we said, you know what, this patient has PAD, multiple risk factors, dependent rubor, we gotta do something. We take the patient to the cat lab. And everything looks great until the, you get to the kind of a mid, uh, below the knee, mid tibial vessels. And here you see that you have this artery which appears to be peroneal but ends up to be a dominant peroneal that becomes the PT. This took us a while to figure out, by the way. This, this was one hour of work, just figuring out that that was, just, that was a dominant PT. But importantly, you see there is no targets in the foot. This patient is not a surgical candidate. And we know that if we don't improve the blood flow 
and we go after that toe, we're going to get into trouble because we're going to start with the toe, end up with a ray, then a TMA, and next thing you know, baloney amputation. So we said, you know what, let's use some of these techniques that we have learned and see if we can try to improve the perfusion in this patient. So we worked hard and we took what I showed you before and created this. I was very excited about this, Dr. Banerjee. Actually, I was going to send the pictures to my mom back home because she always complains that I send you to the United States to become a doctor and you became a plumber because I always said I'm a plumber. But as I told my secretary to get the pictures ready for me to send it to my mom, unfortunately, the patient came back. And I don't know why patients keep coming back, follow up, you know. <laughs> you know, a patient came back and I was like, oh my God, what happened here? I worked hard. It looked good. I didn't do atherectomy, so I know there was no embolization. I just did angioplasty. And, you know, I learned that, yes, this is not unusual, actually. A lot of these lesions, after you improve the blood flow, they demarcate. So some of it is a natural progression of improving the blood flow, is demarcation. Some of it is that maybe I cut off some collateral flow. But at the time when I saw this, I was like, you know what, I got to look into this and understand what's going on. So I repeated the hemodynamics. Remember, pre-procedure, the patient was 0.55. <coughs> after the procedure, the patient is 1.04. So I did great. I doubled the ABI to normal. But I knew that the blood flow issue was at the level of the distal foot, not the ankle. Because remember, the ABI only gives you information about the blood flow to the ankle and not the distal foot. So I went after the TBI. Before the procedure, the TBI was 0.24. After the procedure, the TBI is 0.16. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So I said to one of my former fellows who is now a big shot, he may be here in the audience, uh, Dr. Bunty, and a couple other ones. I said, you know what, we got to go look at the hemodynamics and look at our patients. How many of these do we have that we thought we did a great job, but yet the distal perfusion is not great? Unfortunately, this slide didn't come out right. I don't know why, but bottom line of this slide is that 30% of the patients with significant CLI, meaning that no straight inline flow to the foot have a normal or non-compressible ABI. So number one lesson is that ABI is very limited when you're dealing with CLI. If it's abnormal, great. But if it's normal, you can say that the patient has good blood flow. You have to look at something else, TBI, TCPO2, maybe our shark winner, you know, Flowmets, uh, the, the group that won the shark uh, tank competition last night, maybe a technology like that that can assess perfusion. And uh, actually, this work was done by Tarek, who is here, you know, one of my former uh, residents, uh, who is now a fellow. And then we said, you know what, let's go back to our patients and see what the change in the TBI is after complex intervention. And honestly, this really surprised me. This really, really surprised me. The normal TBI, mind you, is anything above 0 0.7, 0 0.7. So in 150 or so patients who started with a median TBI of around 0.2 and a half, after complex intervention, and I consider myself at least average, the TBI only improved to about 0.3. So the incremental change in the TBI after complex intervention was very, very small, and indeed almost none of the patients had normal blood flow to the foot. So while we do a great job with the macrovascular, we learned that we are not doing a great job with the microvascular, and this information actually predicts reintervention. So if your TBI doesn't improve by more than 0.275, that means that you're going to need a reintervention. And basically, this led us to this idea that can we supplement macrovascular reperfusion with microvascular therapy, meaning that we know we can do a good job with macrovascular, but what can we do about the microvascular? Because we have this issue. We really cannot improve those little blood vessels in the foot. So we did this trial that I presented at ACC, and basically the concept was that can we use a biologic therapy, in this case JVS100 or STF1, which is known to do all these things, you know, promote, repair, promote new blood cells, prevent cell death, and heal scar tissue, and multiple animal studies, and also human studies, 
to see if that we could combine these two to try to heal these ulcers faster and improve blood flow to the foot. So we enrolled 109 patients from 21 centers across the United States. It was a double-blinded, randomized clinical trial. And these are the centers, really grateful, because it's very hard to enroll patients in the CLI studies. We had a steering committee, independent data, and safety monitoring board. We had an independent statistical analysis, and a wound core lab adjudicated laboratory. So we were pictures taken, all went to a core laboratory, and the primary endpoint of the study was actually wound healing. So the inclusion criteria for the study was the presence of a chronic wound of greater than two weeks that met one of the perfusion criteria, and then the patient underwent a successful revascularization. So we actually wanted the patients to have good macrovascular revascularization. After they had a good macrovascular revascularization, they were then uh, had a perfusion assessment. If after macrovascular revascularization, they still had lack of good blood flow as measured by a TBI of less than 0.51, then they were randomized to SDF1 or placebo. And we included end-stage renal disease, osteomyelitis of heel ulcers, and complex lesions. Basically, we started with 167 patients and ended up with 34 patients almost in each arm. These were the size of the injections in the foot and in the lower leg. And the way we defined primary endpoint was based on a staging of a five to a minus five. So a complete wound healing was five. And if the wound got bigger by 25% or patient had a major amputation was minus five. There were a number of safety endpoints such as male and others for the sake of time. I'm just gonna skip this, but I think you can see that the baseline characteristics of the patient Good number, about 10% had end-stage renal disease. 80% of the patients had diabetes. 80% diabetes. And you can see we had a good number, I would say about the 10% of the patients had e heal ulcers, which are typically excluded from these kind of trials. And the ankle brachial index, as I told you, in known patients with significant CLI, well, look at this, is near normal. So you can't really rely on the ABI. But look at the TBI, 0 0.26, 0 0.27, 0 0.26. So remember the limitations of ABI. But this was what we found, and this was really surprising to us. So we found out that in each group, only 25% of the patients healed by three months. So in a vigorous trial, selecting very carefully the sites, doing macrovascular revascularization by some of the experts in the field, only 25% of the wounds healed at three months. And actually about 25% in each group got worse, despite successful revascularization. Unfortunately, there was no difference between the groups in regards to healing. So the drug, this therapy, the biologic therapy did not work. But I think we learned a lot that only 25% of the wounds completely healed at three months, and actually about 20% got worse um, you know, at three months. And if you look at the TBI, again, it highlights the limitation of what we do as a macrovascular operators. So pre-procedure TBI was low. After the procedure, there's some small incremental change, but that did not improve with SDF injection. So we were not able to improve microvascular circulation. So anyway, there were a number of limitations about this study. One of the challenges with biologic therapy is that it's hard to prove that it's working. And this is one of the challenges, but I really think that we need to think this way, either with pharmacotherapy or with biologic therapy, because even though we're doing advanced macrovascular work, is not enough. We need something else to help us with the microvascular. Anyway, with that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. And Dr. Erb, I don't know, couldn't make it here. And Dr. Jun Lee is going to give his talk, and that is comparing uh, stent and no stent strategies for infra inguinal uh, perfluorate disease. Jun, thank you for thank filling you. in. Thank, thank you very you. much. By the way, I asked her to do this about an hour ago, so uh, <laughs> you know, you can't. I actually that. tried to edit the slides, it wouldn't let me. So we <laughs> we're stuck where we are. He had nothing to disclose, though. <laughs> Is it going to go? Um, okay. Back. What happened? Storage. 
So what I'll suggest, if there is any technical fault, Jun, hmm. take a seat. I'm going to ask uh, uh, our next speaker, uh, Brian, to take over, and I'm going to go and fix the, your slides. Okay? So let's switch. I don't think the slides are coming up here. I can uh, fix okay. it. Uh, you can fix it right now? Yeah. Okay, try it. Okay. So, Brian, I think I would, in the interest of time, we are very tight, so I humbly request you to uh, take on your talk and talk about cutting edge uh, wound care, uh, and we'll then work on uh, June's slide and then bring them up. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And I uh, have nothing to disclose, and I'd like to thank the uh, staff and the uh, coordinators and the event chairs for having me back this year. Uh, it's a great event and uh, a lot of great things happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit today in the brief time that I have about uh, management of some complex wounds. Uh, there's a lot of discussion throughout today and throughout the week about um, reestablishing blood flow down the lower extremity. Well, what do we do when there's significant soft tissue loss and how do we manage those wounds? So here are the facts. I think it's important to understand these to, uh, to really get a grasp of the problem. Every 20 seconds, a limb is lost uh, secondary to complications of diabetes with more than 2,500 limbs lost per day. Those who have had an amputation carry over 68%, now approaching more like 80% risk for reamputation over five years. And 85% uh, of diabetic foot related complications are preventable through a team approach. And I'm fortunate to work down at the Bailey College of Medicine in Houston, where we're a part of a multidisciplinary team where we work side by side with vascular podiatry to help manage these complex low extremity wounds. So this is a really important slide that I, I like to highlight. Um, we, once our patients have gotten to the point of uh, being healed, we, we're trying to change the terminology and the way we approach things. And this slide really highlights things um, as to why we will now educate those patients on being in more of a remission status versus in a healed status. And if you see on this slide here, the comparison of mortality rates, mortality rates for neuropathic ulcers, amputation, ischemic ulcers are much higher than some of the most well-known cancers out there, prostate cancer, breast cancer, et cetera. So I think that by educating the patients uh, early on, letting them know, hey, listen, if you don't change your habits, if you don't change your lifestyle, get in the appropriate shoe gear and followed routinely by a podiatric surgeon, uh, chances are that wound is going to reoccur. Uh, so I think that having them understand the concept of remission, it's, it's, it's better, better absorbed by those patients and they know how to better manage their uh, time, time moving forward and how to better help get, keep those wounds healed. So we'll jump right into a couple case presentations. Um, this is a 55-year-old African-American male. He initially presented, um, you can see all stuff, initially presented with um, gas gangrene of his uh, foot. And here's a picture clinically of this patient. Um, so most people would see this and in, in, in automatically recommend BK. And certainly it's not anything pretty, uh, but this is the world that I live in and these are the things that we do. And it's most important for us to get these patients uh, in remission and back to walking. Uh, studies show that the longer these patients are, are out of work, uh, it's a significant draw on, on the financial system of our, of our health care system. And it also uh, allows these patients to be able to continue living their life uh, minus an amputation or major amputation. So you can see here from a radiographic standpoint, there is gas gangrene and there's some uh, gas uh, along the dorsal surface of the foot. The patient underwent an angiogram by our uh, team and you can see the uh, multiple uh, segment and occlusions here. And here he is uh, post revascularization. So now he's got flow redirected down to the foot. So this is generally handled in one of two ways. In a lot of cases, if somebody comes in with an emergent infection, we'll drain that infection first, and then they'll go over to the vascular surgery team to have a revascularization performed. In those other cases where maybe those patients are somewhat stable, we'll go ahead and perform the revascularization first, and then we'll go and uh, follow up with uh, footscaping and or debridements and other things that need to get done. So in this particular case, the guy was taken back to the operating room for debridement. You can see we removed a lot of the necrotic tissue. Uh, believe it or not, this is probably one of the most ideal type of wounds because it's on the dorsal surface of the foot. It's not a weight-bearing surface. So these things, in reality, are a lot easier to offload, and it makes it uh, management of these wounds long-term uh, a lot easier to deal with. So here you see we've taken the operating room, uh, we removed all the necrotic tissue, and on the right-hand side, uh, once the infection was controlled, we do these typically in stage debridements. Our average length of stay is about five to seven days for these more extensive type wounds, and that includes stage debridement, usually wet to dry dressings at bedside, and then they return back to the operating room for um, some type of coverage. And you can see here, this is an application of a bovine-derived uh, allograft uh, that we use fairly often for these really large deficits to help basically create a scaffold between the underlying soft tissues and the, and the surface of the foot. And here you see the progression here. This is the, um, that bovine collagen uh, dressing. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a bilayer type dressing. That top layer is a silicone layer. After about two to four weeks, uh, we'll separate from the underlying collagen surface. And here we are. Now we have an, a, a very active, healthy granular base and a wound that's optimal for a split thickness skin graft. So the patient subsequently went on to have a split thickness skin graft. This is generally our graft of choice. Uh, we rarely do any uh, arterial pedicle flaps, rotational flaps. We find that uh, these are, work quite well. If we can get the patient back to a, a place where we can have a, a manageable foot, then this is what we do. And he subsequently lost another toe throughout the process. But ultimately, you can see him on the right side, and the foot's now completely healed and or in remission. And the gentleman's back in the shoe, back to live his life, back to work, and taking care of his family. I don't know if we have time for another uh case or no I think short on time okay well thank you very thank much you for your very, time I appreciate being you. here and uh, hope you learned a bit. Dr. Lee thank you I hope your technical issue is resolved please uh, invite you back again to talk about stent and non-stent uh, therapies in inframinal PAD Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, uh, no disclosures relevant to this talk. Um, so, the question uh, for this talk is stent versus no stent strategies. There's a lot of options out there, as we all know, uh, including on the, on the left side here, you can see a multitude of different stenting uh, available bare metal stents, which includes nitinol as well as steel uh, stainless steel uh, stents, drug eluding stents cover stents, um, different techniques that we may also use, including pave and crack and tack it. Uh, and then the no stent options, including POBA or drug-coated balloons, uh, plaque modification with atherectomy devices, obviously bypass surgery, and then uh, medical therapy as well. So how do we choose? Um, the SKY consensus guidelines, actually, there's a lot of things that are read here. You can see here, this is actually the recommendation from SKY. Uh, of which you know our panelists are authors of, um, the DES and DCB are usually are the ones that are recommended as 1A uh, class um, recommendations, BMS uh, being in the yellow, so maybe appropriate. A lot of the other things when you talk about doing atherectomy as primary, as the primary treatment modality, that's actually in red. If you look at the second adjunctive, uh, which I don't have it on a slide here, if you look at the secondary adjunctive therapy, atherectomy may be uh, appropriate and usually falls within the yellow or orange category. So obviously we, in interventional cardiology and uh, endovascular space, there's a lot of toys to play with. Um, when you have so many things that you can do, um, depending on the modality that you use, there's a number of permutations that we can use to treat each patient individually. So for example, if you're choosing between PTA, DCB, and stent, uh, just bare metal stent or a nitinol woven, interwoven stent, you know, if you use three different options, there's six different ways that you can treat this patient um, as an example. A nice meta-analysis came out in 2017 comparing the different modalities. And all of it actually essentially all are compared to balloon angioplasty as our kind of baseline treatment modality here. Um, so, other, so our options then for treatment can be summarized from either a 30,000 foot view or um, a little bit more granular, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so for endovascular treatment uh, in the femoral popliteal lesions, you can either go with a stent first approach um, with angioplasty and then subsequent stent. And as we discussed, there's a number of different stents that we can employ. If you approach it uh, use with a stent-free um, technique, meaning that the goal is actually to leave the patient with no stent, um, then we try to optimize the lesions using either angioplasty, specialty balloons, or even atherectomy, and then ultimately trying uh, DCB, and then using stent as only a bailout strategy. Obviously, you can get much more granular uh, with a lot of different kind of confusing pathways. Um, but in general, we follow the, uh, the, uh, the primary pathway of trying to do no stent up front. Um, so here, uh, Herb wanted to actually highlight several new technologies that are coming, uh, are becoming available um, that we may not necessarily do uh, yet in all of our facilities. But uh, there's a, three different things that we're going to talk about specifically. 
The first one is lithotripsy, so essentially a balloon angioplasty catheter that has lithotripsy emitters kind of throughout the balloon. Um, and as the balloon is inflated, uh, the uh, lithotripsy uh, uh, emitters actually disrupt calcium by circumferential um, pressure pulses. Here's a nice uh, review from actually cor the coronary literature. Here, uh, this is an OCT. This is a pre-OCT. You can see actually circumferential calcium uh, uh, around the coronary highlighted by this, um, the black uh, mark here. And you can see actually all the way around, it's actually very thick on this side. That's why you don't see the, kind of the distal edge of the calcium. After lithotripsy, what you can see here are the breaks in the calcium. Um, and then uh, following that, uh, a stent was placed. In the periphery, um, we have a study, uh, Disrupt PAD, um, which showed that at 30 days, we actually have 100% patency. And that patency actually maintains at, at six months as well. Um, supporting that perhaps uh, this may be an attractive uh, mechanism for calcium modification. So a couple, uh, one case here. So this is a calcified ephemeral popliteal um, case. Here you can appreciate the amount of calcium here in the mid SFA. And then it becomes occluded. There's significant calcium here, as you can see, uh, occluded into the popliteal and reconstitutes in the P2 segment. Um, so the, uh, the lesion was uh, crossed, and you can even appreciate here even better on actually just fluoro, the amount of significant calcium that encompasses the SFA. So this is the lithotripsy balloon. Uh, so using that, um, lithotripsy was performed, followed by conventional PTA, and then followed by DCB. There was residual stenosis, um, which required the uh, placement of nitinol interwoven uh, stents. Uh, followed by post dilation. And here you can see the baseline on the left and then the final angiogram on the right side uh, with significant improvement despite um, the amount of calcium. It, very importantly, especially, I think we talked about it this morning, especially with the interwoven uh, nitinol stents, you have to achieve um, adequate um, lesion prep in order for the stents to expand nicely. So this case demonstrates that with the augmentative uh, support of lithotripsy, they were able to achieve that. The next technology that we're discussing is the extracorporeal shockwave therapy, which essentially um, deliver, delivers a shockwave to externally, um, and it's a 20-minute uh, per treatment session. Um, here is a uh, small kind of study, uh, essentially the first study, uh, looking at sham control versus active treatment group. And here what you can see is uh, the maximum walking distance as well as the uh, pain-free walking distance is significantly improved in the active treatment group compared to the sham group, uh, even up to the 12-week period. Uh, which this uh, secondary table, which I thought was interesting, is that at, even at baseline, though, um, the active treatment group did uh, have better function than the sham control group, um, despite randomization. Uh, and then even at 12 weeks uh, out, that improvement, th so they started out better. They did improve more, so that improvement actually ma uh, maintained for uh, 12 weeks out. Um, the third uh, kind of strategy that we wanted to talk about um, in terms of up and coming uh, strategies, this is actually a stent strategy. So when we perform any balloon angio uh, angioplasty, the mechanism of lumen gain is actually by dissection. So we know that when we do POBA, for example, or PTA, we're actually creating dissection planes. And dissection can range anywhere between a small kind of minor radiolucent area to the very extreme is total occlusion without any distal uh, integrate flow. And typically, the patients that have worse dissection tend to do worse over the course of time. There's a higher rate of restenosis over the course of time um, if you leave dissections that are either class C or above, much more than those who have A or B dissections. Um, so the idea of tack it is um, that you would tack essentially the uh, proximal dissection flap, and that lessens the amount of stent that is left behind in, within the vessel. Um, so that such that you maintain kind of the normal integrity of the vessel without uh, placing a form, kind of leaving a foreign body within there. Um, it preserves future treatment options as well. Um, so this is the TAC uh, optimized um, uh, data, and what you can see here, uh, the dissection grade um, 
actually uh, was, you know, it can range up to, uh, according to the core lab, um, you know, it was much higher than, you know, just A or B. Uh, and here's a couple of uh, cases here. So the baseline here is a lesion. You can see that it's calcified. It was balloon angioplastied. Um, and then this is after the balloon. And here you can see significant dissection. And still residual dissection with contrast kind of flowing behind the dissection flap. DCB and still uh, the residual type E dissection. Uh, so uh, TAC was uh, deployed here. I actually looked at this uh, very carefully. It looks like uh, maybe three TACs were used um, and then uh, subsequently uh, post dilated. And this is the post result. So the conclusion uh, is that there's a myriad of different technologies that we can employ uh, in treating SFA and popliteal lesions uh, with stent and no stent modalities. Um, and obviously there's a wide variety of schemes that we all use. Um, everyone has their own algorithm. Um, but in general, we try to uh, go with a no stent upfront technique and use stenting only as a bailout strategy. Um, so relatively, uh, you know, the safety and technology, uh, efficacy of the technology that we talked about today have not truly been evaluated in head-to-head -head randomized controlled trials. But however, there's a lot of uh, up and coming technologies that are available. Dr. Lee, I wouldn't have ever said that you prepared in an hour. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let me invite uh, none other than Dr. Thomas Zeller to talk about and define what he believes is cutting edge endovascular therapy. Dr. Zeller, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for, for the invitation. Well, um, m my intention is not to talk about a specific treatment modality. Um, it's simply um, showing you that the field of endovascular therapy is replacing step by step uh, the open surgical approach. So, okay, let's go ahead. So what is cutting edge endovascular, in endovascular therapy? Yeah, so we are uh, covering more and more the last domains of vascular surgery. One of those domains is the common femoral artery. Well, it's uh, considered as being the gold standard for surgery due to the acute uh, success rates, which are almost 100%, uh, reported patency up to 95%. However, there are some side effects which are not uh, essentially benign. There's a 30-day mortality of 3.4% uh, reported in recent literature. And there are minor complications, which are sometimes not, e not trivial, up to 20%. So end arterectomy is not a benign uh, procedure as previously believed. What are the options of endovascular treatment? Well, mainly balloon-based, in some uh, cases also bare metal stents implanted in a registry we published recently. You can see, well, restenosis rate is not really um, convincing. However, if we are looking on primary stent approach and azorectomy approach in this location, uh, the outcome is becoming better regarding uh, TLR rate. So at that time, no DCB, no DS was used. What we know from a published uh, randomized control trial from, uh, uh, from France is comparing uh, stents with open surgery that what is not really surprising, morbidity rate at uh, 30 days is favoring the endovascular approach. If you have not to cut, it's more safe and um, more benign than uh, implanting a stent via uh, um, a st uh, an endovascular approach. And besides that, <clears throat> there was equal clinical and technical outcome reported at two years um, by trend even favoring the stent regarding uh, freedom from reintervention, uh, patency rates. So there was no clear benefit for the open surgical approach uh, uh, in the presence of stents. The key problem is, is standing the right decision? Uh, what about directional azorectomy? This is a case done a couple of years ago by one of my coworkers. Azorectomy had been done. This was the result due to the haziness at the origin of the SFA. A stent was implanted, and this is the outcome in 2010. And four years later, we uh, could perform 
an angiographic control, and you can see that there is a slight narrowing of the common femoral artery and also some uh, near intima uh, proliferation in the SFA, but there was no significant stenosis. Uh, of note, no DCB was used at that time. And this is a, a summary of our follow-up data um, of uh, endovascular procedures done based on, um, on azerectomy with and without uh, drug-coated balloon angioplasty. And <clears throat> this is uh, the uh, outcome at a mean follow-up of almost 30 months. So uh, we had a 15% uh, re-intervention rate uh, equally distributed between endovascular and surgery. We had a clear improvement in, in Rutherford class and in ABI. And this is the background of the ongoing PESTO CFI tri uh, CFA trial, which is comparing an azerectomy plus DZB-based endovascular approach with open surgery. Uh, it's a, a study enrolling 306 patients in total in 10 sites in Europe, and the primary uh, efficacy endpoint is primary patency at 12 months and the primary safety endpoint is the 30 days uh, event rate. So what about uh, task C and D lesions? Well, the means of bypass surgery as gold standard, is, it, is this really true? Some surgeons claim primary patency rate of uh, venous bypass graft as five years of 80%. Is this reflected by the literature? No, it is not. Bypass uh, primary patency rate at 12 months is plus minus 78%. This summarizes venous grafts and prosthetics grafts. The problem is, what is the definition of patency in surgery? It's flow or no flow. This is data from Bosius from Belgium. He looked on uh, patent bypass grafts at, at one year based on the definition of binary restenosis, which is used for endovascular procedures. A 78% uh, um, primary patency did drop to 70% if we use um, the strict duplex criteria. What data do we have comparing bypass with endovascular approach? This is prosthetic bypass against Wirebahn, and you can clearly see this is old data already published in 2010. Up to four years, there was essentially no difference between a bypass graft and the Wirebahn. This is recently published work from uh, the Netherlands comparing intended venous bypass graft against Wirebahn. It's a small study, but anyhow, the outcome is not really surprising. If you look on the morbidity rate at 30 days, clearly favoring the endovascular approach. However, if you look on the one-year primary patency, you can see in green that's the endovascular uh, curve, and in blue, that's the venous bypass graft curve. And there's essentially no benefit for the venous bypass graft. The outcome of the venous bypass is less good as previously self-reported uh, in the um, surgical literature. Another study looking on the comparison between silver PTX and uh, uh, prosthetic bypass graft. This is a bigger study enrolling 220 patients. Enrollment is complete um, currently. This is interims analysis, 100 patients analyzed out of 220. Um, there is a trend towards uh, a better outcome regarding um, events at 30 days. And if you look now on primary patency, again, it's an interim analysis, but only 40 patients missing. And uh, silver PTX by trend better than bypass surgery regarding primary patency. Same holds true for freedom from TLR. And <clears throat> if you look now into the data of 50% of the patient population at two years, there is no change in outcome. Still, there is no significant difference favoring the bypass approach in task C and D lesions, and uh, this uh, difference by trend is better favoring the endovascular approach. So in conclusion, new generation endovascular techniques obtain similar technical and clinical midterm results as compared to surgery in common femoral artery and task D femoral property lesions provided the same diagnostic measures are used. Morbidity of endovascular techniques is significantly lower as compared to bypass surgery or thrombant arterectomy. Maybe prosthetic bypass results are not as great in terms of patency as vascular surgeons always considered, but even venous bypass graft outcomes seem not be um, superior to endovascular approach. So that's what I um, consider the cutting edge. This is the future that endovascular will also 
play a major role in these um, um, goals or uh, uh, indications considered as being the gold standard for surgery in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a perfect segue uh, to invite Dr. Nazal to provide a master's view of cutting edge surgical revascularization. Thank you very much, and uh, it's difficult really to follow Dr. Zeller. Um, if I have to listen to Subhash and Mahdi, my friends, they want me to say there's nothing in you. And, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> So actually, the vascular surgery, the way we describe it in the past, is different than what we know it now. Any vascular surgeon who is trained it means he's a hybrid surgeon. He's endovascular, vascular, and a hybrid. And that's the definition of surgery. The surgery we look at 2,500 years ago does not exist now. I always say a surgeon who claims he will do everything by open procedure, he's a general surgeon, he's not a vascular surgeon. So this is completely different. So vascular intervention, the cutting edge, I include the medical therapy, which I leave uh, to my friends, but it is both minimally invasive, open, and the hybrid, which is the advances now, the hybrid procedure in which you can have both endovascular and open procedure. It will cut down on the disadvantages of both. Unfortunately, not many people trying to do that and pushes the envelope more in both ends, the open and the endovascular. It's got stuck here. So if you look at the practice in the past many years, between 1995, 2009, look at the practice of vascular surgeons, you will see 2009, everything else coming number one is endovascular procedure compared to 1995, which was open. Even in Germany, the same thing. Everything that is really in the realm of vascular intervention is endovascular, not open procedure. Having said that, this is a study which we are doing and publishing soon. Uh, we looked at all revascularization, all of them, the last six years, and this is the latest data that we have, administrative data. We found actually revascularization staying the same. Minor amputations are increasing in spite of the fact actually the endovascular technology is improving, the vascular technology is improving, but the major amputations are the same. So we are not hitting anything really. Amputations are the same, no change. So cutting edge vascular surgery, it started a long time ago with the carotid endarthrectomy and the history we all know, but it extended to stents. And these are very firm results. Actually, there are variations depending on the surgeon, but these are collective results. As you can see, varies from very low to a high. So everything we do nowadays, we have to compare to those results minus, of course, the morbidity of the procedure. We still all face the same challenges. That's why we fail in surgery, whether it is open or endome. The new intimal hyperplasia, medical therapy that helps longevity, small caliber vessels, and prosthetics. What do we do with those prosthetics devices in case we don't have any venous conduit? What we are trying to achieve, an off-the-shelf tissue engineered graft, and this is coming soon. It's a 50-year, actually, project that is almost, we are almost there. Use a human vascular cells to populate the scaffolds to create vessels for the conduit. And use of stem progenitor cells to populate scaffolds again in order to produce a conduit that can be used using the patient's own cells in order to minimize new intimal hyperplasia. I think it will apply to both into and open down the road once we find out or the scientists find out how to solve it. And this has been, as I said, uh, produced by many authors. I'm not going to go through many of them, but these are very small vessels that you can actually produce on the lab and apply to either humans or animals. Most of the studies so far in animals, this is how small are these actually graphs now. So you can remove it from the shelf and put it in a patient. And this is experimental here. You see the blood flow, and after a few months or a few weeks, 56 weeks, you see that there is no even change in the anastomosis areas in a very small vessel. 
And this is great. Once we have it on the shelf, things will change in the open. Then we have multiple engineers' vascular graphs. Nowadays, with the printers, the 3D printers, you can print anything you want. The good thing about it, actually, you just put the scaffold, print whatever you want, and the good thing about it that those printers, you can have different sizes, like if you want to fit different vessels, different sizes, and again, it's coming down the road once we, uh, it is accelerating now to put it on the shelf. And there are different ways of doing that. Then we have the decellularized conduits in which you take the vessel and decellularize it completely. Don't put anything and put it in the uh, patient. It causes thrombosis, but add the progenitor cells to the uh, conduit, then you will have much better result. Again, the longevity will be very high, and there are multiple, actually, forms for that that's been under study and evaluation. Some of them actually using a tubular form, some of them using different forms to produce. What about the hybrid procedure? For any clinicians, if you have both, you can do the hybrid procedure. It will improve the outcome of the procedure, improve selection of the procedure, and provides the best of the two worlds. Each one of them has advantage over the other. So if you combine them, you get the best result, which actually overcome both the open and the endo procedure. There will be no change in the technique how to do, because this has been perfected. Whether it is carotid, whether it is a year to buy fem, there's nothing beyond that. It's how to deliver it to the human body is the change in the future. And these hybrid procedures are really better when you combine above and below the inguinal ligament. And if you see, if you look at actual the combined, these multiple procedures are done, we use it a lot, we never report it because it's taken as natural. This is the way it should be done. I'm sure if we want to report our group uh, will be at least 50 to a 70 procedure a year, but we don't report those data. Hybrid procedure, lower and upper extremities, mesenteric arterial occlusions, which usually fails endovascular, you make a small incision, deliver the vessel outside, an endovascular approach without doing the bypass. This is again a new procedure, portal veins, we did many legions actually in the portal vein with their tumors, thrombotic occlusions by pulling the intestine through a five centimeter incision and cannulate one of the veins, open technique, and do anything you want without avoiding going through, uh, through the jugular vein, inguinal vein, or going through the liver, and the patient can be done under local anesthesia, patient then can go home next day. So these are minimally invasive that we can use that both endo and open failed when you combine both of them uh, together. We use it in TIPS procedure, difficult TIPS procedure those. So the advances in chemical bonding of grafts, drug coating, genetic engineering, tissue engineering, stem cell coating, they are all coming. And robotic surgery, although many people tried it, I will not advocate it really, but it is one thing that you can use it minimally to achieve higher end result if you know how to do robotic. And this is an example of some papers. They use an aorto bifem, uh, aorto iliac bypasses in, through small incision, minimally invasive. Next day, patient is discharged. So the cutting edge surgical revascularization, it is really nowadays paralleling endovascular. What we learn from endovascular, we are applying it to open. Things to reduce new intimal hyperplasia. Endovascular led the way in this, but it is being applied to open. Open techniques has been perfected, so there will be not change. Am I doing it retrogradely, antigradely, uh, forward? This is according to the preference of the surgeon, but again, bad surgery, give bad result, whoever is the surgeon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting talk, and I think we're going to move on in the interest of time uh, on strategies to cut cost in the cath lab. I think Dr. Jafar Golzar is going to give this talk. I think you've all heard multitude ways and variable ways how we all can approach different lesions, but I think to be cost effective and keep that in mind is essential. And I think no one can do that better than Jaffa. I don't know about that, but um, so thank you very much, Subhash, for the introduction and the invitation. <clears throat> so I fine tuned the uh, title just a little bit. How do I get to the presentation? Okay. So I fine tuned the title just a little bit because. I'm not in an outpatient lab, I'm in a hospital-based lab. 
And so there is a difference on uh, your motivation and uh, the ways that you would save money, I believe, uh, if you're an outpatient lab, but I don't have one. So we're gonna talk about um, how to save money in a hospital-based lab. And these are my disclosures. So you would think, why is it important? Why is it important to say, you know what, I really want to do a good job and save the hospital money? Well, it is important because you want to build a reputation as a responsible steward of the hospital. This gives you leadership positions. This gives you ability to bring in new technologies. And a positive influence for the hospital brings you to a different stature for that hospital system. So when we think about cost, it's actually more than just cost, right? It's about total revenue. That's what the hospital cares about. They talk about total revenue, which is uh, the revenue that you bring in for each case minus the cost of the procedure. So we have to think about both. So I'm gonna uh, kind of delve into both of those. Now, how would you start doing this? If, this? if you say, yeah, you come away from this talk and say, yeah, you know what, this is probably important for me and for my hospital, how do you do it? Well, the way I started is, is the first thing I did is I went to our cath lab manager and I said, I want to see the cost of my procedures and I want to see how much I brought in for all of those procedures for the past quarter. So I did that when I first came to this hospital and I track it even now. And the reason that's important because we learned a lot of things actually because I was one of the first and one of the smaller hospitals to start doing a lot of these procedures and they didn't know how to bill correctly. So for the first six months, they were losing money for atherectomy procedures because they were billing them as angioplasty procedures, and they weren't aware of that. So we had to go back to our billing department. They made those changes, and so that's important. The, uh, and for you personally, that might be important because you might not be billing correctly. You might not be dictating correctly. So in order to, first we'll talk about maximizing your reimbursement. So in order to maximize reimbursement, there are several components to this. First of all, you have to make sure you dictate the patient complexity and the procedural complexity. Understand how different treatment modalities are reimbursed. Know which vascular beds are reimbursed as separate vessels. And if appropriate, if appropriate, use the same device for multiple vessels. So let's talk about patient complexity. This is really important. Make sure this is in your h &P. Make sure this is in your discharge summary. Make sure it's in your note. Patients that have congestive heart failure, coronary disease with previous revascularization, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, all of these things add to the complexity of your patient, which subsequently means that the hospital gets reimbursed at a higher level. Now, procedural complexity is also important. Multi-level disease is built at a higher level. The complexity of procedure is built at a higher level. And usually what I'll do is you can have an extra code added and I dictate at the end of my procedure, this procedure took approximately 50% more time than a traditional procedure of this type. And then your coders can pick up on that and there's extra coding that they can give you for that. So when we think about understanding how to bill correctly, this goes through the different stages and the different levels of uh, what you can bill for, iliac, femoral, tibial. So really understanding the vessel treatment groups. So what can you bill separately? The common iliac artery, external iliac artery, and internal iliac artery are billed as one unit. So if you treat all three of those patients, uh, all three of those vessels, it's only going to be counted as one vessel. The profunda femoral artery, common femoral artery, and superficial femoral artery, as well as popliteal artery, are all billed as one vessel. The tibial perineal trunk, peroneal artery, and posterior tibial artery are billed as one vessel. And the anterior tibial artery is billed as a separate vessel. So if you understand that, then you can kind of uh, understand how to make sure that you're uh, billing this correctly and that your coders pick up on this. But at the end of the day, when we think about newer technologies that have a higher success rate sometimes, uh, they may be able to save you some time. They may be more efficient, but they're more expensive. So you have to balance that with the traditional technologies or less expensive technologies, which may be a greater learning curve, but have a lower cost. So we talked about how to increase your revenue, so how do you decrease costs? Well, first of all, you gotta know the cost of the equipment. So there's several equipment, for example, we were looking at uh, one of the devices in our hospital the other day, and a similar de device was $800, 
and another comparable device was $350. I didn't know that till about two weeks ago. It was just a microcatheter. So if I hadn't known that, I wouldn't know that, you know, I'd choose one over another. So find out what different devices cost on the shelf. I perform an inventory of the cath lab equipment routinely, and I replace more costly products that are equivocal with less expensive options, especially in commodity products, such as microcatheters, wires that are equivalent, or sheaths. So as you can imagine, there's a variety of different costs for different devices. Usually you think about the fact that wires and catheters are probably the cheapest. Balloons are, you know, about the same level. Crossing devices, stents, DCBs, DESs, and so forth become more and more inexpensive. So if you think about each step in your procedure, if we dissect each part of your procedure, how can you cut costs in each part of that? Vessel access, you might be able to cut some costs in the type of sheath you use because there's a, a wide variety of cost with a certain sheath, and if you feel like it's equivocal, that might be an opportunity. In terms of lesion crossing, again, maybe you may be able to fine tune your wire and catheter that you use, or you may consider different crossing devices, but again, that goes to that balance of efficacy and uh, time saving. In terms of treatment options, you may not have much of a choice. Angioplasty balloons are about the same price. DCBs are about the same price. Atherectomy devices and stents are pretty much the same price. So there's really not much opportunity to wait there. In terms of vessel exit, manual compression is obviously doesn't cost anything except for the fact that you're increasing your length of stay. Patient is laying in the uh, you know, convenience. I always use closure devices. I think it's worth the money. So why is, if you do all of that and you dissect all of this stuff, why is the hospital still losing money? Again, look for correct documentation. Is there something going on that you're not documenting correctly? Maybe you're not doing the procedures right. Maybe you're doing a CTO, it takes you 10 wires and five catheters and all these other things. So learn newer technologies, learn pedal approach, learn new ways of doing things that may, may make you more efficient. And there are new devices that are always on the market that, again, make you more efficient that will probably allow you to maybe cut costs on wires and catheters and other things that you may be using, that you're using a lot of. Maybe you could replace it with one of those crossing devices. But most importantly, don't give in to temptation, especially if you have an outpatient lab. Do not try to save money by unnecessarily staging procedures. Do not withhold technology with a clear benefit due to cost. And do not treat a patient based on their insurance status. So in conclusion, I think it's important to help your hospital save money. It's not only important for your career, but also for the longevity of the hospital. Remember, total revenue is not just cost, but the revenue of the procedure as well. Understand how to maximize your billing and coding, your reimbursement, cut costs by choosing less expensive commodity products. Understand that there's a balance between cost and efficacy. Look at the global picture. You may lose money in certain really complex cases, but in general, you'll look at the bigger picture and it'll still bring you patience if you're having successful cases. And at the end of the day, do what's right for the patient and you'll always win. Thank you. Thank you, those were words of wisdom. Uh, I would just add to that cost saving is the probable consideration of R2P that might let patients go off the hospital sooner. So the next talk is really intriguing, Gary. We are very interested in hearing how does sequence of processes gel into an endovascular practice talk. So please, please enlighten us. Is it a benefit or a curse? Thank you very much. These are my disclosures. If I can get that to go forward. There we go. So supply chain. I'm not sure how many of you guys even know you have a supply chain. But is it a blessing or a curse? But you got to learn how to use it to your advantage. Again, these are my disclosures. Dealing with competition, competition in healthcare is really problematic. 
As you can see from the last talk, there's a lot of different drivers that everybody's having. But realistically, we need to be able to work together so that we can actually start to save money and do what's right. How do you stay competitive in vascular care? Well, what's slowly going away is a referral-based security. Mail's thrown away, letters are e-filed and not read, dinners are not attended and can be illegal, gifts are illegal. Separating yourself by being the best is sometimes very difficult to communicate. What's not going away or coming up is the first of the three A's that we had since we were medical students, and that first is access. Economic advantage, patient experience, and convenience. And in fact, you know, they don't want McDonald's, they want you to be working like McDonald's. If you look at what happened in the beginning of time from healthcare delivery, it was actually just kind of cutting things off, making diagnoses. There wasn't a ton that we could do. And then we turned into the technological era where we had lots of things. We had Army Swift knives, we had operating rooms, we have catheterization laboratories. We have everything we can do to try to make us look glorious as to what we do. I'm not sure our outcomes really have changed that much, but we certainly look a lot better doing it. Why don't we have socialized medicine in the United States? That'd make it a lot cheaper, right? Well, if you really look into this and see why, it's because this is what Stalin said. If you want to control a person's, if you want to control a person's health, you control the person. And Reagan said there's no more better way to get um, socialism than to do it with socialized medicine. So that's why we don't have it in the U.S. But what we do have is just outstanding costs. Our average spending health per capita is way too high. When Mike Backrack was still working in the operating room, these were the kind of, I'm just kidding, Mike. These are the kind of bills you used to see. Look at that. The operating room fee was $5. But look at the, look at the Medicare fraud. Professional discount, eight eighty five. You now go to prison for that. Things have changed. What other things cost in 1942? A car was $1,100. Gasoline was 19 cents a gallon. Bread was 9 cents a loaf. The stock market was at 119. The average annual salary is $2,400. The minimum wage was 30 cents per hour. Now, what about 2009? If we had kept the inflation that we've seen in medicine in the basic everyday things that we buy, a dozen eggs would cost $85, a roll of toilet paper would be $25.67, a pound of butter, $108, a pound of bacon, $129, a pound of coffee, kind of close to today, $68. What things cost in 1942 compared to what are there in 2009, look at the difference. And that's what we've done to healthcare in the United States and around the world. We should be ashamed. But what of the current system? We act like there's a bottomless pit, ladies and gentlemen. We are broke in the United States. We're broke in the world. We have an elderly population, and we're throwing tons of money at people, and we have our kids to support. We're going to have such a huge deficit that our kids are going to be in debt until their kids and their kids get around to it. Our medical costs are absolutely non-sustainable. We are over 20 percent of our GDP. If you look per capita again, it's much higher than the rest of the world, and even theirs are too high. If you look at the total federal budget, most of that's on health care. It's much more than defense. Health care delivery then is under pressure. There's economies of scale. You're seeing uh, uh, physicians being employed, and if you think that isn't a plan to then control us, you're crazy. And there's a volume to value focus, which if it's your, at my hospital and is your hospital the same, it's primarily looking at that bottom dime. But we have to be less a part of the problem. We do unindicated procedures as physicians. We play for restenosis sometimes. We're, I mean, I can't believe I was at a, a vascular surgery meeting, and the vast majority of the audience, when there was a good plain balloon, balloon angioplasty result on a long lesion, said that was good enough. We're doing the highest reimbursement procedures when not needed, unnecessary testing, dealing with procedures, deals under the table related to device use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we all should be ashamed because we then allow everybody else to say, well, if the doctors are doing it, we as hospitals can do it. They're a Ponzi scheme. And if you look at industry and pharma, they're making huge profits. So we as physicians have to be a driver for change. This cartoon is too brief. Just look at it in your cartoon thing. Supply function does a lot of things. They help you get your devices. They help you have materials so that you can do your work. They do a lot of things, inventory control, logistics, a lot of things like that. But the reality is there's historically separated from reimbursement. I remember when I told them, well, there's a pass-through code for drug-coated balloon. They said, we just deal with acquisition. We don't think about the reimbursement. 
Little one sight into the important stuff. Pacemakers are all the same to them. Promotions are driven by cost savings. They have the two and a half year rule on administration. In two and a half years, I want promoted or I'm out. So they never do anything but cut costs. Trying to build programs is very difficult in that time frame. If you negotiate a part of, I'm sorry, negotiating is a big part of their job and supply chain. Little insight into research and relationships. They have no idea about your doctors, your, your other companies, research, those kinds of things. And they actually have little insight into advancements. Remember, the only thing they can get from a company is what's on IFU. They can't look it off label because that can't be presented to them. Now, there's upsides to a functional relationship with supply chain. You can make, be more competitive with the payers. If you can get the price on your devices down, you're more competitive in the future with your payers. There's less emotion. I mean, oh my gosh, how many different scoring balloons do we have to have on the market at a huge amount of money with no freaking data? Is that crazy? But we're buying it all the time. Well, then drive down the cost with your supply chain. We can get the physicians out of awkward moments by being working through supply chain and not only by yourself. You can help drive more uniform procedures to help with procedural evaluations and outcomes on a local level. If you're all doing the procedures somewhat similarly, you can measure your outcomes locally in your, comp in your community. If you're all doing something different, whatever you want to do, you can never figure out what's going on. You can never adjust for inequality. Uh, there's pl plenty of commodity opportunities, as was uh, noted earlier. Working together helps them make better decisions. They want to make good decisions. They don't want to hurt people, but they don't have the insight not to do that. Decreased waste of expiring devices is decreased waste. Less unexpected, it's like the equipment you wanted isn't available anymore. Help us build a partnership between the physicians and institutions, and since so many of us are employed, you got to get that. And it can work towards getting a percentage of savings invested in your section if you work it right. Here's just an idea of what we look at in our compliance. We're part of the Accelerate Project. So we have this on a monthly basis. We tell where we're at with our commitments. And we only do commitments for commodity items. But you can see that for our pacemakers, we're 99% um, effective uh, buying the same. Everybody's using the same stuff. Coronary stents were at 98. Uh, coronary bear stents, we only had two used. It's kind of crazy. Uh, PTCA balloons, you can see just down the list that we're getting there, and we've only been doing this for about uh, eight months, so we're already getting there. Summary, there is non-sustainable cost of today's health care. If we don't want to play a major role in reversing this, patients will be hurt. Working to develop insight uh, some, with supply chain will be best for everyone. Pick your battles to help win the war, and that's better care and cheaper care in the United States and around the world. Thank you. I think uh, this is such a big topic that eight minutes or nine minutes cannot do justice. Hopefully, you all can connect with Dr. Ryan. So uh, physicians and practices are beginning to think like businessmen and using these, uh, inform this information bank. Now, Dr. Garcia is going to tell us how do we take what Dr. Golzar told us about cutting costs <clears throat> and selecting a product through supply chain relationships and how to translate that into selecting specific devices for our lab, especially when there are five partners and they all want to do things differently. No, yeah, Subash and uh, uh, the remainder of the uh, d directors, I want to thank you for the uh, kind invitation. This is probably the least sexy talk in this entire session. I, I just want you to be aware. I don't take it personally. Um, it's really must-have tools in, in the uh, endovascular suite. So these are all of my conflicts that you just saw come through, and um, uh, they really have, for once, really no, no impact on this uh, talk. So what you need, you've already seen it from Jafar and a, a very nice talk from uh, Gary regarding you can have everything you want on the shelf, but you don't need everything. You just need to have certain things and be able to do a procedure. Uh, whether it's sexy or not is irrelevant. It's really how best to treat the patient at the least amount of cost to your center. So access tools, sheaths, wires, this is what this talk is all about. And from sheaths, you, you need to get in there and you need to maintain position. And it depends on what you like and who you have a premier account with. As long as you're with that group, it will work. It's a tube. As long as you get in and out safely, that's the most important thing. There are some differences, whether it's a, a destination sheath or a rabbi sheath. Uh, I think I, I left it up here. There is one sheath that we use a lot of. It's really from an unknown source. Uh, it's a named individual by the name of Ansel. But it's actually pretty good. Uh, and then you have various guide wires. You're going to use 035 guide wires. You're going to use 014 guide wires. You're going to have CTO guide wires. Whatever you use in the coronaries, whatever you use in the periphery, get used to it and start using it and work 
with it, whether it's a workhorse or a commodity uh, specialty, it becomes important to you. But you don't have to have 12 CTO wires on the shelf. You just need one or two. You don't need 14 different uh, glide wires on the shelf. You just need one or two. So just kind of come up with what you need and then stick with it. And as you become facile with it, you'll grow. How to cross lesions, you're going to have things uh, that have become important, whether it's anti-grade, are you, gonna, are you aficionado of always being true luminal? Can you tolerate a subintimal approach? How about transcollateral or retrograde? These are you know, kind of sexy these days, but not really terribly necessary in today's world in many cases. Reentry devices, you will go off the beaten trail, so you'll need one or two. You'll need some CTO devices, but again, one or two. The specialty devices uh, to cross for luminal crossing or near luminal crossing may become important, but the problem with these devices is they're uh, important up front, and you only need them when you fail trying to cross with a simple wire, so it becomes kind of this catch-22. So a stepwise approach, if you're unable to cross cleanly, look for alternatives. One would be uh, try to cross anagrade. Here's simple anagrade crossing. If you can't cross anagrade and you find that you have a nice collateral bed here, you could probably make your way across that collateral and work retrograde. Again, fairly simple, but you just need a wire and a support catheter. Again, a commodity, not terribly expensive, and all you're paying for is really a stent. But if you can't get there anagrade, and you can always get there somehow, retrograde is a great opportunity, whether or not you like to radiate your hands or not are irrelevant, and then you can go down the road of fixing up an artery, make it look pretty. But the key for all of this is limb salvage and patency. We always talk about limb salvage, but what's lost in the conundrum of science many times is the patency of what we have at the end. These retrograde uh, techniques are really lovely. They look fantastic, but again, you have to have a mechanism to follow it, and you've got to prove that you're actually doing some good for the patient, not just limb, uh, limb salvage, although it's very important. Once you get there, you've got to have catheters to get you there and back again. Again, you've got to be able to drive your car to and from work. So you've got to have things that will allow you to transfer either wires or technologies over this uh, system to allow you to get in and out of trouble. And whether or not you use something all the time, we like the, uh, uh, the old Spectronetics, now Philips uh, systems, or you like Cook, it's irrelevant. They're all basically tubes that allow you to do your work. Once you get there, if you have to get off the beaten trail or you like CTO devices, whether it's the old Lumen device uh, or the Outback catheter, have it on the shelf and get good at it because you will need it in your practice as you move forward in time. The Outback, again, is, uh, has been around since, uh, gosh, when I was uh, beginning my fellowship. And uh, it's a very nice, very uh, user-friendly device. It makes perfect sense. You line it up and you then deploy the Snitinol. Uh, hypotube uh, needle allows you to pass your 014 wire and it gets you back into the lumen with the least amount of work. But again, this technology will cost you money and it will affect your marginal costs. While you're doing your work, no matter how you look at it, whether you like to cut, shave, or just do plain old balloon angioplasty, you will have times with distal embolic debris. And so there is a myriad of devices now for distal embolic protection. Again, everybody and their cousin will make something. You don't need them all on the shelf, but you need to have something on the shelf. And from time to time, you will have to pull it. That will cost your margin. Whether you do atherectomy or not, or if you're in an OBL or not, it will cost you on your marginal costs. Balloons are a commodity, as, as Jafar said. And, and, and really what's critical to balloons, if you ever lived in the coronary world, we had to learn when I was a fellow the uh, workhorse balloons, which were very compliant. Then you had semi-compliant and then non-compliant. In the peripheral world, all of these devices are almost invariably semi-compliant, which simply means they grow. But what does that mean, that they grow? What they have is differential expansion. You have to remember that there's resistance to expansion, and then there's least resistance to expansion. And where the balloon will expand or grow is in that least resisted area. And so you'll get differential expansion, which leads to dissections uh, and potentially perforations. But some of the devices that we have, the Dorados or Conquests, are non-compliant. They're made out of Kevlar. So when you dilate them up and they go, they go to the certain size, and they're always going to be that size. So they can crack fairly resistant or recalcitrant leaves. And both styles can go to high pressure, but you have to note the rated burst pressure in any balloon. And most devices, even today's 035 devices, are almost invariably exceedingly deliverable, much more so than they were in the past. So when things just don't get you there, you're really going to need some help. Uh, there are a whole bunch of specialty devices that are made specifically for crossing CTOs. Uh, the Viance or Antir has a 150 uh, centimeter working length, five French sheath compatible. Basically spin it through and try to find a luminal passage. 
the off-road or true path, 100 centimeter or 70 centimeter working length, six French compatible, hypotube with a center balloon, which tends to try to direct you towards a loom. And it gives you a distal push, which is, uh, in many cases, several uh, fold in gram strength higher than you would with just a wire. The Roxwood device, which was just sold, is 125 centimeters and six French compatible. Fairly intriguing night and all cage to help you center. The, every one of these devices, if you think about them, they all presume center location design, center location for lumen, when in many cases that lumen may not be straight away from you. The Cruzar, which is a Houdini device, is an invaginated balloon. Again, it pushes out, invaginates a balloon out, and allows the uh, wire that's entrapped in it to be then expressed at a two to one metric for, on distance. And again, idea is that it maintains luminal position. And then the cross lock, which is a, uh, from Radius Medical, 125 centimeter working length and six French sheath compatible. Again, something that will allow you to maintain a luminal position as you try to go forward. And then the Avenger device, the Ocelot device using OCT technology, tries to maintain a intimal medial position rather than towards the adventitia. Pedal access tools, uh, a whole bunch of various devices which can get you into a lumen distally. Uh, the cook system is, is pretty much the ones that we use a lot of. It's a check flow valve for, uh, for a French device, but larger sheaths have been used in the, in the lower extremity uh, to get you uh, retrograde pedal access. And in many cases, um, the support catheters here are now dedicated to pedal access and support in these uh, fairly uh, non-forgiving arteries. But you could take an artery like this, which is uh, a, 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 a termination of a perineal artery, trying to revascularize a limb, and come around and actually use that as a conduit for retrograde pedal, meaning through the transcollateral, and then work anagrade to work around the pedal arch. And uh, you've already seen this picture with the, uh, with the revascularization of the tibials. One other thing that you will have to have on your shelf is thrombus aspiration. Almost invariably, every one of these is a big straw. They just aspirate, that's all you're doing, and everybody and their cousin will make one. Find one that you like and use it. Uh, there are various tip strengths and various tip loads, but at the end of the day, it's just basically a five French catheter, and it goes downstream, and you try to aspirate what you've embolized. There is a need for rheolytic thrombectomy. There's still power pulse spray. The only way that AngioJet has maintained its, uh, its position in this world is in the periphery after the AMI trial uh, fell flat in the coronaries. And it's a pretty good device. They now have a myriad of devices, small, medium, and large, to get you there. But there is various competitors work, which work very well, one of which is the Penumbra device, basically a big tube that goes to a suction vacuum, and you basically agitate the hell out of the thrombus, and you basically break it up and aspirate it into a big tank uh, right there there, and it works. It works very nicely, even in sub, uh, subacute thrombus. So in this non-sexy talk, I apologize. These uh, conclusions are fairly straightforward. Devices and selection of method of intervention remain at your discretion. It's always going to be up to you. You can make it as expensive or as least expensive as you want. Access and contemporary interventional approaches really a allow a myriad of technologies and devices for ultimate revascularization, and the issues that remain is that we may still be too aggressive in the pedal arch. I really have a hard time believing mucking around down there is going to be good all the time. But you know, if you can get away with it, it works. All devices are available. And you need to pick one or two and become facile with any one of them to uh, actually have a fairly productive and good program and cost-effective program in your hospital. And understand the primary, and then follow it up with your backup approaches when any of those primary approaches failed uh, in any one interventional case. Thank you. So we are running close to time, and you know we have a very simple uh, way that we have tried to control an algorithm and equipment in our lab is not to deal with it like your closet or my closet, where I can't throw out a shoe or a T-shirt, and I'm not worn it for the last five years, but I still can't throw it away. So what we have done is that we have assigned all the inventory to someone specialized from logistics, and they present us data of how much and how often we are using stuff. And so if it is only physicians are going to assign this, you'll not be able to get rid of something you've never used. But I think the logistics folks can help you do that, and that'll be important. So I think I'm going to invite my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Fazal Latif, who is going to show how to use limited amount of equipment and do a great case. Is that what it is? I do not know, but I, I just want to make sure you don't use too much equipment actually, in this case. Absolutely, I'm not going to use any of those $1,000, $5,000 devices and just uh, uh, drive home a point. Uh, that sim sometimes simple stuff works, and uh, uh, I hardly find a case where I don't learn something from, uh, despite having 
been doing these procedures for a while now. So I'm going to present a case. Uh, here are my disclosures. A 74-year-old man with critical limb ischemia, he had an ingrown toenail that was eroding into the, uh, into the toe and uh, was, uh, developed an ulcer. And he also had long-standing claudication, of course, history of cabbage, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, extensive history of DVTs in his right lower extremity, which may have played a role in what's, uh, what I'm going to show. Uh, significant claudication. I did an angiogram on him four years ago. He had a long occlusion starting in mid-SFA all the way to uh, uh, distal popliteal in the P3 segment. Uh, but, uh, he was referred to vascular surgery, but he refused to have surgery, and now returned four years later with CLI, but refused surgery again. So here is his angiogram. You can see how this long occlusion goes all the way down until the P3 segment, and here is the reconstitution, and you can see the TP trunk, AT is gone, and then uh, th there are uh, the PT and uh, uh, the peroneal uh, go down all the way to the foot. So. Um, Basically, uh, I was again not very hopeful that, uh, that we may be able, that we will cross uh, true lumen to true lumen, but I used a, a loop Clyde wire, uh, and uh, it, it crossed uh, fairly reliably until uh, the um, until just after the re, uh, en entering into the P3 segment. Uh, where I straightened the wire and exchanged it for an 018 wire, but the wire ended up in a large collateral. You can probably notice over here that the wire doesn't seem to be going quite where the peroneal is, uh, but it, it looked fairly good, uh, and I tried multiple times to enter a good distal vessel, but I couldn't. At this point, I did not want to give up the progress because, you know, we have crossed the popliteal. So I thought even if I'm able to uh, uh, revascularize the popliteal uh, segment, it uh, would benefit the patient to, to some extent. So I did a PTA of the uh, SFA and the popliteal using a photo balloon, and this is what I got. So basically, there was not, not good flow, uh, maybe a perforation, maybe an AV fistula, because uh, as you can see, that there is some flow going back. And uh, you can notice over here that this was going below the knee, below the knee extending uh, uh, down as well. So uh, I was, again, I was confident that probably you know, our reentry is OK up until this point, but then this segment was not looking good, and then our wire was not in the true lumen uh, distally. So uh, anyway, I decided, uh, 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 I thought that the origin of the AV fistula is above the knee, so I decided to put in a covered stent. So that segment looked okay. I put in a stent upstream as well, but there was still a lot of AV fistula. You can see on both sides that there was significant flow going into the veins, uh, and, uh, uh, and this was at that point. So of course, you know, the last thing I wanted to do uh, uh, was to put in a covered stand across the knee. So uh, um, I basically decided to stop and allow healing. Uh, I still had a good runoff at this point. The patient developed uh, some swelling in the calf region a few, day, uh, a few days later. However, his claudication improved. Um, uh, I showed the uh, case in CATH conference, got criticized for what I did, as you know how the drill goes. But anyway, I uh, decided to bring the patient back uh, about a month later. Now, you could question how uh, long these patients should be brought back. Um, some people uh, suggested I should bring them back uh, within a few days, but it, uh, anyway, I decided uh, to give it a month. And uh, on the opening shot, uh, four weeks later, actually, the fistula was completely gone. And you can see that you know, there was uh, good flow all the way to this segment, uh, and uh, there was good flow into the popliteal also. But of course, it's still not an inline flow. Um, and uh, it was hard to tell whether there is a little channel that uh, goes into the um, uh, PT or not. We tried anti-grade uh, uh, to try to get into this uh, channel, uh, uh, but there was no channel there. So uh, at this point, uh, we came uh, pedal and, uh, uh, and saw that actually there is a, uh, in the simultaneous injection, that there is a disconnect. These two lumens were not talking to each other, and, and therefore we had to use something different. So uh, this is e using some of the uh, coronary CTO techniques, and uh, this is an angulated picture. So they, these, they, this is a Corsair catheter, pilot 200 from above and Corsair from below. Uh, and this is, again, it's angulated, so they look far apart, but they are pretty close to each other. 
the retrograde, uh, we used uh, uh, the wires actually kept going into the peroneal, you know, making this U-turn. So it was very hard to direct this uh, upwards. But finally, uh, crossed with, uh, with the hornet wire into the true lumen, into the uh, popliteal, and uh, this is how it looked afterwards. Uh, balloon this area, and this was kind of our final uh, result. You can see now there is inline flow into two vessels. There's still that uh, dissection behind, but uh, it still uh, established good flow. This was our final result. This was a good two-vessel runoff. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, this was our final result. So what I learned from this case was that uh, some of these AV fistulas and th that extensive history of DVT may have played a role since these, these patients' veins are bigger, maybe they are closer they, uh, to the artery, and therefore these uh, have more tendency to form if you get subintimal. Uh, but uh, uh, you can almost always come back. So staging the procedure at times can help uh, by allowing time to heal. And uh, um, uh, I thought that, you know, finally we were able to achieve a good result for the patient, and uh, he felt uh, much better and was able to un undergo uh, uh, his ingrow toenail uh, uh, removal. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. I mean, I, uh, I applaud you for two things. Number one is it takes a lot of uh, foresight and courage to share not a perfectly done case, and we all have those, and sometimes they remain buried in the archives. So thanks for bringing it out. And I'm sure there are a lot of discussion points that these cases would raise. You know, I, I, if you guys want, we can continue, but what my suggestion is that there is coffee outside. There is another series of eight case-based presentations coming up right after coffee, and we take our questions to the panel and exchange thoughts and ideas over coffee. How about that? Thank you very much. Thanks.